Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to this Inside Identity 6.0 session. I'm Ade, your host for the morning, Ecosystem Fund Manager at Oasis Protocol. Today, my thoughts and opinions are mine and do not reflect those of Oasis. We'll be discussing the role of KYC as a catalyst for DeFi and Web3 adoption in Africa. Inside Identity, formerly Digital Identity Matters, is a webinar series powered by Core ID, a Verify Me company, in partnership with Tech Cabal. Core ID is a digital identity platform that makes it easier for businesses to connect to trusted identities and critical consumer analytics. The platform provides API infrastructure and customer insights to commercial and digital banks, fintechs, lenders, insurers, telcos, and utilities for onboarding, sales, and compliance. So this event is organized by Tech Cabal Insights, the events, research, and data analytics arm of Tech Cabal. They're an Africa-focused digital economy consultancy that leverages big data to help startups, investors, operators, big tech companies, government, and other ecosystem players on and off the continent to answer specific questions and implement key implementations. So right now, I would like to invite a core ID rep for the opening remarks, Ni Okunoi, please take the stage. Thank you, Ade. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, um, it's a great honor um, that I address this um, distinguished audience today and the panel too. Um, I'm very glad to see you all um, on this webinar. And uh, thank you for taking your time to join us today. Uh, my name is Ni Okunoi. I'm the head of growth for Core ID Ghana. Um, Core ID, which is a Verify Me company, um, is basically a B2B platform that provides businesses with digital identity, um, as well as analytics solutions. That basically helps them to scale, the, scale uh, while maintaining regulatory um, compliance. Um, today, I will be sharing a breakdown of what our speakers will be um, discussing. The theme for Inside Identity 6.0 is um, basically KYC, know your customer, as a catalyst for DeFi and Web3 adoption in Africa. Now, um, basically, this looks, like, like, looks at how uh, KYC compliance can fuel um, the implementation of decentralized finance, also known as DeFi, and Web3 in Africa. Um, globally, there's an increased interest in decentralized finance, as you can imagine, um, as a result, result of the popularity of Web1, you know, Web2, Web now Web3, um, as DeFi allows people to carry out transactions without the use of banks, um, stock exchanges, et cetera, or, or other third parties, basically. Um, the ecosystem, however, um, is prone to some challenges that can put people's money at risk, as you can imagine. Um, this emphasizes the need for KYC more than ever to strengthen the Web3 and DeFi um, ecosystems. So um, our core ID, we are very, very excited to be leading this conversation um, with the speakers of this episode. And if you want to find out anything about us, you can go to www.coreid.com or send an email to business at coreid.com. And I'll say it, I'll repeat that again. Uh, you can find out more about us at by visiting www.coreid.com or send an email to business at id.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ni. And now for a breakdown of how the event will go, we will have a 40 minute panelist conversation with many great insights coming in, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A from the audience. Now let's have an introduction for the panelists. First up, we have Babs, who is, who is a pioneer in Nigeria's blockchain landscape, playing a major role in the growth of crypto adoption in the continent. As the Africa Director of Binance, 
He has led several projects within the ecosystem and has driven the growth of Binance on the continent from day one. He was recently featured on Forbes Africa by Penriza in a report for the Undiscovered series. Currently, he serves as the CEO of Bundle, a social finance app dedicated to making crypto accessible to everyone, and also Fiat Business Director for Binance, the largest global blockchain ecosystem. Next up, we have Erican, who is the founder and managing partner of, of Audacity, a cultural asset management firm investing in multi-trillion dollar markets worldwide. Audacity's foundational thesis is that culture and community are the future of asset management. She's also the co-founder and president of Crypto for Black Economic Empowerment, also known as CBEE. Otherwise known as the Crypto Black Wall Street, CBEE is an ecosystem and community of Black African crypto founders, investors, and artists across 20 countries building the new internet. CBEE members have trailblazed Web3 by generating 1 million in NFT sales in one minute, growing crypto investment portfolios by 75x, and launching new industry-leading businesses and investment firms. Prior, Erican was a financial services relationship manager at LinkedIn, where she was a thought partner and strategic advisor to a portfolio of 200 asset management, hedge fund, venture capital, and private equity executives. Near the end of her tenure, Erican reached 180% quota attainment and was number one relationship manager in her business line in North America and number two in the Americas. Next, we have Babajide Ogunjobi, who is the Verify Me Vice President, Products and Data Strategy. Jide is an experienced data software engineer and architect with almost 15 years of experience in the engineering leadership roles in the United States and Nigeria. Jide joins Verify Me from Move Africa after having roles in innovation and as chief technology officer. At Move, Jide led the architecture and development of technology infrastructure, including building out re real-time solutions for onboarding and analytics services, leading to the company's Series A funding. Jide has an MBA from the University of Florida and a bachelor's degree in management from Florida State University. He joined the Verify Me team to build identity and data products that connect identity to consumer analytics. And last but certainly not least, we have Hanu, a pioneer in the Africa crypto space, the founder CEO of Patricia Techno Technologies, an alternative payment solutions company that is redefining everyday transactions through the power of blockchain technology, one crypto transaction at a time. His dream is to make Africa the most desirable place for innovative transactions, which led him towards, the, towards introducing unique positive markers that will drive user experience and excellence in service delivery to the next level in Africa and beyond. An avid traveler, on a never-ending quest for knowledge, Hanu has proven himself a trailblazer in the fintech and crypto space over the past five years. As you can see, we have an exceptional uh, pa uh, panel of speakers with us today. Let's dive into the panel segment. All right. So my first question to all the speakers today Yes, here we go. My first question to all the speakers today is Web3 is Web3 technology is relatively new in Africa and so much more information about it is not yet accessible. Why is it important for us to pay attention to Web3 and DeFi? That's a question for all the panelists. Who would like to go first? Uh, I can go first. 
Um, so I think uh, one of the, the 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 biggest things about Web three, which I think you know for, uh, why it's important for us to pay a lot more attention to it, a lot of attention to it. It's um, on a larger scale. It's you know it's I think it's really an accelerant for for Africa and African. Um, uh, the population in Africa, multiple countries in Africa, um, it is essentially an accelerant and an opportunity for you know for Africans to essentially be able to take advantage um, of new technology that allows us to become you know to play on the same playing field as a lot of uh, first world countries and first world um, companies, so to speak. You know, because, you know, so far we have been, you know, Africa in general and a lot of third world countries have been lagging. We have, you know, we, we get, you know, we're, we're taking 10 plus, you know, years, you know, technolog technologically to get to where, you know, country uh, companies and countries in, in the first world, you know, have, you know, you know, get to, you know, Web3 seems to be, you know, in my opinion, is, is that unifier and that accelerant for us to essentially, uh, get on the same playing field as you know as those countries and as those you know first world companies. Um, we're no longer playing catch up. We're no longer um, saying, "Oh, we don't have you know, we don't we, we don't have the capability." Because now it's a situation where you know, as long as you have an internet connection, as long as you have access to a a, a, a few certain protocols, right? Now I can make transactions. Seamlessly now, I can have communications, um, seamless communications with you know counterparts in the U.S., U.K., China, whatever, doing you know the same types of transactions um, as those as you know my peers in those countries, and no longer saying you know you know I, I don't you know uh, with no longer having that blocker or having that you know um, you know firewall that allows that you know, doesn't allow that those kind of transactions. So I think really, the, you know, the big thing for Web3 for me is we're getting to a play, you know, to a stage where it's now, I wouldn't say we're on a level playing field yet, but it allows us to get to a much, you know, uh, 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 the same level field, uh, playing field um, much quicker than we used to have in the past. Mm. Yes, yeah, very insightful. Thank you, Jide. Um, I also want to, um, I noticed that you kept mentioning first world companies. Um, in this decentralized age, what makes a company first world? I mean, you, I think we all know what I mean when I say first world companies. We talk about the Microsofts, the, you know, the Facebooks, the Apples, and, you know, the companies that we all look at, the Googles and, you know, the companies we all look up to and we see as pioneers in especially, you know, not just, and I mean, I, I, I mentioned a lot of tech, technology companies, but also, you know, think about financial companies when you talk about, you know, uh, financial, you know, uh, trading companies, banks, and so on and so forth. Those are the companies that even us and, you know, uh, uh, you know, in Nigeria and African countries, um, uh, we look up to when we are trying to build solutions. We look at and say, "Hey, this, you know, these, you know, companies um, are so, uh, you know, quote unquote, best in class." You know, those are the companies that we see what they do. We see the innovations that they're, you know, that they're bringing uh, out, and we say, "Hey, we want to build our." Um, you know, we, we we would love to, and this is where essentially we would love to have a service or a product that is close to that. You know, I think that that is where Web three sort of gives us that, like I said, um, not instant unification, but sort of it gets us there. Um, you know, closer to those type of services a lot quicker. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And uh, would any of the other panelists uh, care to chime in or challenge anything that Jide has said? <laughs> Uh, yes, I would like to chime in. Um, well, first up, before I go, I want to say a um, big thank you to the Tech About team for organizing um, this event. Um, it's very nice to get an opportunity to preach the gospel of Crypto Web 3. And um, also to my panelists, Emmanuel and Jide, um, well done. And also to you, our, our host, um, big well done, Ade. Um, so to jump into it, um, I think that... Um, Web3 is really important uh, because piggybacking what Jide says, right, it's, it served as a first opportunity to level the playing field um, for Africa, you know, because um, Web3 stands the biggest opportunity to, to democratize finance and to give access to people who, um, Africans who would not have gotten this opportunity, case in point, people like myself, um, 
being able to build a crypto a, a crypto exchange um based off of web3 is a new frontier that um is very young and africans have found a way to innovate on it with little or no support and um it is still very early days and i believe that um we can continue to do the most around this area now the the, the conversation on defi is an is a totally different ball game um from web3 because um, it's, it is still very teaching, you know, the concept of DeFi is still very teaching as what we have today are, most, as, are mostly centralized exchanges and centralized businesses. But um, I also believe that uh, with DeFi, that's where we see the true democratiz democratization of, of finance, where each person is able to own his, own his or her own assets, own his or her own data and control what information um, they put out there. So I like to think of it as the fifth revolution. Um, DeFi and Web3 is definitely a part of the fifth revolution. Money is changing. The way we interact uh, is changing. The way we store data is changing. And um, the Web3 is going to be the bedrock and the building block for the next frontier of innovation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you, honey. So true. Uh, Web3 and DeFi are definitely going to change the way we do business and the way we live going forward. Um, Babs, over to you. Yeah, um, thanks, Adi. And, you know, as the previous speakers have said, um, this gives us an opportunity to leapfrog, right? Um, we, we definitely can't afford to not pay attention to this you know, fourth industrial revolution. Um, Web3 is basically allowing people today transfer value over the internet. Before now, you could only send information. You could, you know, send an email. You could, you know, meet someone on social media, but you still needed like uh, third parties to, you know, hold, you know, um, identity, to hold funds and you know all that um, infrastructure that couldn't be built directly on the internet. But today we are seeing more and more self-executing you know, um, programs you know, built on the blockchain existing on the internet that provides financial services to people in Tanzania, for instance, which is where DeFi comes in. So, it's definitely something we should pay attention to. And, and I think that's why, you know, everybody is here to really, you know, deep dive and kind of like even, you know, learn more about this, this you know, innovation. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Fabs. And, uh, and we've been joined by the lovely Erican. Um, we ju I've just asked a general question, if you'd like to chime in as well. I'll repeat the question. And it goes, Web3 technology is relatively new in Africa, and so much information about it is not yet accessible. Why is it important for us to pay attention to Web3 and, and DeFi? It looks like Erican is still connecting. Okay, we'll come back to that question. Uh, but a question for you, Hanu and Babs. The technology in the DeFi space is in many ways revolutionary, but there are still significant challenges to be faced before mainstream migration seems realistic. Can you shed some light on what these challenges are? Okay, um, I'd like I'll go first. Um, I think one of the biggest overarching um, challenge that we face um, in the industry is regulation. Um, and it is by far the biggest challenge in my opinion, because with regulation, we can finally begin to see the um, inflow of um, institutional funds into the industry. We're talking pension funds, we're talking hedge funds, we're talking large um, institutions coming to uh, bring capital into this market and they can only do that when there is um, adequate regulation and at the same time regulation is also going to serve as a form of customer um, uh, protection you know like with the case of FTX that we just recently um, saw um, it's a very young market it's still very early days so um, 
you know, we have to go through these cycles and regulation would ensure that we go through these cycles, um, right? We go through these cycles without um, so much um, dents or bit up to the industry, you know, but at the same time, there has to be a very thin line, you know, in form of what regulation can be because the job of regulators really is to is to um, provide policies that um, that protect the customers, but at the same time still leave enough room for innovation from the uh, from the institutions, you know. And I think that that is by far one of the biggest challenge in the industry. Um, next up would be um, next up would be basically infrastructure and um, technical know how. You know, um, I run a blockchain company. And the number of blockchain engineers out of a hundred, we're, we're talking about five, you know, and these five are self-taught, you know. Um, so it's a it's a huge challenge to find the right talent uh, to be able to supercharge and hypercharge your growth in that in that front, you know. But um, at the same time, the the honors lies on us really to be able to uplift our people and to be able to do what's necessary to make that make that work. But um, I think this will be my my top two um, contributions on this topic. Yeah, um, thanks, Hanno. So just to also share some more on like regulation and why it's so important. Um, it's like back in you know when when cars were just newly created. Imagine you had cars without seat belts, right? Without traffic rules and and all that. So it's a key challenge we have to overcome. Um, to really go mainstream. Another thing that would help us go mainstream would largely be um, education, because today there there's a lot of confusion, you know, with you know what is Web two, what is Web three, what is crypto, what is you know DeFi. There are a lot of buzzwords, NFTs. You can name them, right? So that that gap um, in terms of like a filter for people to to understand this, to consume this, this, this abundance of information in a very organized, you know, manner. Um, because now we see scammers taking advantage of it, you know, ripping people off, you know, launching projects and stuff like that. So we want to be able to ensure that people understand how to protect themselves in this, you know, new um, technology where you, we say, you know, you are your own bank, right? You, you, your own bank means you're in charge of your own security, <laughs> you know. So um, it comes with its own risk, and that's those are the kind of things that I think we definitely need to also overcome in terms of like ensuring the proper information is out there, structured information that people can consume, and you know protect themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks to both of you, and uh, also. Um, further to what you've said, would you say it's true that these problems are not unique to, to blockchain, crypto, DeFi, Web3, but it's something that we've seen even in Web.1, point, Web.2.0, point Web um, you know, the abundance of Nigerian princes who were emailing people, um, telling them to give them their account numbers so they could help them transfer funds. Um, do you think this is just sort of a, a mutation of that. And people need to be aware that, yes, this is a promising technology, but just as you've had to, to uh, protect yourselves in the past, you have to learn to protect yourselves when we're dealing with, with this, new, this new wave of technology. Exactly, Adi, exactly. Um, you know, when, whenever there is a new innovation, I, I like to tell people that we, it's, if you look at the movies we watch, right? You know, about like the cops and the good guys and the bad guys. Who is usually more innovative in terms of who is usually one step ahead, right? Um, usually the bad guys are always trying to learn new ways to, you know, rip people off, right? And same with every technology. So it's not peculiar to crypto. It's not peculiar to Web3. It's not peculiar to this whole conversation. It's It happens everywhere. Scams happen. Scams have always existed, you know? probably since the time that men began commerce, right? So this, this has always been there. And for every time a new innovation comes up, you have to learn to, to safeguard yourself. You have exactly. to learn to safeguard your world. So yes, 100%. Thank you. Arakan, a question for you. And thanks for joining us. Um, we're seeing more startups tap into Web3 evolution 
and there's also corresponding investor interest. What excites you as an investor about the potential of this technology to drive innovation in Africa's financial industry? I think there's, and hello everyone, I think there is a lot of potential. However, the impact of what we're seeing um, with the contagion in general in the industry is admittedly going to set back some of the optimism and hopefulness that you know I would have had to answer this question a month ago. But nevertheless, um, I think what's most important is that we as Africans recognize what we were able to do when we learned about a technology that we thought could be in our interest. And I, and I, as much as some people may have been burned by just recent experiences, I think it's actually a good thing in a way, like a silver lining, because now so many different Africans who have frankly led adoption of this technology in the world between 2020 and 2021, there was an increase of 1200% of crypto adoption into Africa, which I think, forgive me, I'm, I hold on and might get the quotation of the number wrong, but I think it's something about $200 billion. So if you could say that in a 14 year period since the beginning of Bitcoin being introduced in the world in 2008 and today, 14 years later, Africans at some point, we got to it a little bit later relative to the rest of the world, but we did get to it and we adopted it and probably used it for speculation, but it's still at the end of the day, interface, interfact, interface with the technology. I think that's actually a good positive step, meaning from this point forward, we can now hopefully be more, more of us be wiser and actually look at the technology and what it is. Because if we've been 419 for almost 20, 30 years, I think that same brain can also say, what can we use with this for a meaningful financial infrastructure for my country because ultimately I, I'm um, it's possible for me to build a business and have airy can slash audacity invest if I can actually use this technology to do the right thing. So as scary maybe as it may seem to think about cybersecurity risk and to generally think about risks that uh, Africans have been exposed to, I'm actually excited that we're going to see more engineers who might want to say, okay, you know what, let me actually see now what this really is. And more uh, fi financiers, more hedge funds, more people, more Africans who are willing to learn what it means to make adequate and strategic and smart investments in a very new volatile technology. I think somewhere in there, that's actually going to be a good thing for us in the future as being innovators and building builders of new technology. So that's generally the sentiment and audacity is a fund that's completely dedicated to Africa and Web3. So we're still active and still excited to talk to entrepreneurs who are building. Mm, mm, thanks. And given Given the global economic slump and the um, and one crypto crash after the other, would you say crypto native investors are just as bullish as they have been? And I'm talking institutional investors. Yeah. So the word bullish is a tough one. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> uh, I haven't uh, embraced the word bullish in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe erring on the side of caution right now. Yes, I would say conservative. I mean, let's finish the holidays. Let's see what happens after Christmas. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> to just see how much exposure. But I think this, this it goes back to the silver lining. Maybe this is my own delusion a little bit. But wow, I'm really excited to now see what the African risk profile looks like going forward. And I'd be so curious to see how uh, Emmanuel over um, at your exchange, like what that ends up looking like going forward. What types of uh, activities on your platform are people going to be doing now going forward that we've developed a sense of caution now around this? Does this transform what the African risk profile is for generally being exposed to financial instruments, financial products? Like there's so much to actually learn from this moment of conservation which certainly audacity is being conservative and really just trying to wait to the um dust settles before we make any like big moves but so yes not 
um, as like gangbusters bullish as maybe this time last year, but like still committed to what we have to build for financial infrastructure across Africa and that never changes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Arakan. And now a question for Hanu, Arakan and Babs. The Web3 and DeFi ecosystem is at a place where a balance needs to be found between regulations and decentralization. How do you think this equilibrium can be achieved? Hanu, we'll go for you first. Um, could you please ask that question again? Yes, yes, certainly. So the Web3 and DeFi ecosystem is at a place where a balance needs to be found between regulations and decentralization. How do you think this equilibrium can be achieved? Okay, uh, well, I think, ask the obvious question. That's what I'm gonna say. You know, we need to, the regulators need to ask the obvious question. And I'll say something and I'll pick up from what Bob said earlier. Um, about um, the analogy with the thieves and the cops, right? Um, the thieves are always ahead, right? And the cops are always trying to play catch up, right? So the crypto exchanges and the DeFi protocols and the DeFi platforms and the blockchains, whatever you, whatever arm of the blockchain you're in, right? We have first-hand knowledge, you know? We have first-hand knowledge. We deal with consumers every day. We understand their pain points, you know, and um, in as much as we are not regulators, we can definitely help towards having sustainable regulation, you know, because at the, at the, at the base of it all, right, regulation exists to protect consumers and also to allow room for innovation. You know, um, like what happened in Nigeria last year when the government banned, banned um, crypto, right? It did not protect it did not protect consumers and it definitely did not promote innovation you know um so that's what needs to be done you know the government and the regulators need to ask the obvious questions we need to we need to we need to um you know bring out a long table and bring out very comfortable seats let's have these conversations you know because we all want the same thing we all want the same thing we're all working towards the same goal you know so that was that that's that is that is what needs to be done in my opinion and um we take it from there thank you thank you and uh, babs or erican yeah erican you want to go first sure sure and um i'll say that this is a bit of a different suggestion that maybe most people aren't expecting but i actually think it's going to be media and entertainment and the reason why I say that is because all of us are still on TikTok, all of us are still watching Nollywood films, all of us are still watching Black Panther, all of us are still, you know, watching World Cup, all of us are still doing these other things that we do in our world to like, you know, be entertained and find just sort of relief in the world. I think it's going to be stories and content that comes on Netflix and Apple and Amazon and all the different uh, uh, Roku TV and everything that tells new stories about what this technology does and ideally starts to integrate what it actually can mean for a regular person's life in context and something that someone sees casually. Uh, more regulars, regulators actually understanding what the impact of these use cases are is gonna be most meaningful. And they're probably not gonna see, see that unless they see YouTubers regularly creating content about how they actually use this technology for more people to understand the different possibilities in, at scale. Essentially what I'm getting at is I think media and entertainment, be it YouTube YouTubers or whatever it is, the people who document professionally are able to paint a picture. And I think given that Nigeria in particular has such a big voice globally in the form of long form content, I actually think that there's a longer term opportunity with more creators and more creative people who can make known to regulators what all of the nuances are here through the content that they create and help create a, a better middle, middle uh, line at scale between the builders themselves and the regulators who oftentimes find it hard to come to the same place and come to the middle. If content can inform that conversation in a positive way, that could be a meaningful thing. 
and Babs, how would you chime in? Yeah. Um. So I I would I would just first of all um just touch with touch on what you you just said now, as regards you know content and how storytelling can help you know um. I think definitely, uh, um, because entertainment is obviously one of the biggest things that you know we 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 export in Nigeria, right? And that entire industry would obviously play a large role in you know creating more awareness in terms of sensitization, um, especially to like the regulators themselves, because they are on those you know newspapers, they are on those TV stations, they are on you know at least their kids are on social media, right? Um, and what, what then happens is, you know, at least potentially they begin to, you know, um, have some form of direct education about this. Um, it, it, a lot of regulators understand because we have different regulators, right? It, it, some of them do understand what this technology is about, while, you know, others may not fully understand it yet. And that's why this kind of information would help them. And then they begin to practice themselves, maybe you know, just try it out, right? And see how it works directly. Then they can maybe fully appreciate it. And then as Anu said, and as Anu said, oh, collaboration is key, right? We have to dialogue, right? Um, there cannot be true regulation without engagement. Otherwise you would stifle innovation, right? So what you don't want is you don't want to um, bringing regulations that would, you know, just shut down the entire industry, right? Because there is value here um, for the common man, right? And as, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain and Web3 continues to grow, Nigeria and Africa must, you know, be a part of that growth. Largely so far, it has really been without government support. Now, imagine, you know, the government now comes in and you know leverages on this technology, leverages on the information, and the you know um, the, the 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 stakeholders who are already building in this in this industry, um, and just having the engagement to to really drive this regulation. Some engagements are happening already, but it can be better, right? And then in terms of um, decentralization itself. Um, decentralization is not something that any, you know, um, government, you know, really would want, right? Because the whole idea is to centralize control. And one of the things that you'd see is even within crypto, we have what we call like CFI and DeFi platforms, right? Um, CFI, um, which is centralized finance, is basically guys like, you know, Patricia, Bondo, Binance. So we basically run a centralized exchange in a way where we operate similar. Um, it's basically like a digital, like a stock market, but you know, steroids, right? So here you can actually engage with people, right? That's the advantage of CFI. With DeFi, that's kind of like the next level, meaning that you there is nobody um to engage with in that way, right? And one of the ways to actually regulate that market is to regulate the gatekeepers, which is the C C5, that's the centralized platform, because people unramp there and then go do DeFi stuff, right? So engagement is critical um, for, for, for there to be any equilibrium, you know, when it comes to regulation and, and decentralization. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have to agree with that. Um, the government needs to engage with the industry leaders and the regulation has to meet the people where they are already on these um, on these entertainment platforms that they're already using. Um, I recently heard someone say that we don't want complete centralization, but at the same time, we don't want complete decentralization. And which is why you have governments where there's a there's a central government and a local government. The two need to work hand in hand. Um, but uh, but this isn't about me. This is about the wonderful panelists we have here. So Jide, I'm going to come to you. And my question for you is: the technology in this space is revolutionary, but as we have highlighted, there are still significant challenges and trust gaps that can compromise consumer protection. How can KYC be leveraged to create a safer experience for users? 
Um, thanks, uh, um, Ade. So I, th I think one thing that we still have to understand is that even though the technology is new, you know, and is you know breakthrough technology, you know, the implementation and use cases are still the same. We still want to be able to pay for things. We still want to transfer money. We still want to trade. We still want to do the same things that we do, you know, with traditional finance, um, but we want to do it on a new protocol, a new network, um, you know. And with that, we still have to abide by the rules of whatever you know country or you know principality where you know, that we're operating. In. So we still want, if we're making payments, we're doing transfers. We have to abide by the rules of whatever country we're sending money from or we're sending money to, right? Um, and that's really where you know, uh, in order to abide by those rules, pretty much uh, every country or principality requires that they identify who is using these transactions or who are doing these transactions, be it trading, be it payments, be it, you know, transfers. Um, and that's where KYC comes in. Um, we, uh, you know, our core idea of Verify Me, we, we do have a lot of, you know, Web3 companies um, and blockchain companies that, you know, that are, you know, our customers and our partners. Um, and they're still, they still need, you know, even, even though they're doing quote unquote Web3, you know, Based transactions, they still need to know who they're, you know, they're they they're, uh, they're allowing on their platforms, right? And so they come to us, and we still do um, what I uh, quote unquote uh, traditional verification, you know, uh, verifying their BVN, verifying their NIN, you know, and, and you know, same thing if you went onto Binance, but based on the country that you are, you know, you're trying to. Um, access Binance from. Binance requires some type of verification to know who this person is. Um, so we still, so KYC is still very important because, um, you know, we, the transactions and, uh, you know, use cases are not the same, are the same, regardless of what protocol, or what technology that, you know, you're, you're doing them on. Thanks, Jay. And to follow on from that, um, an open, permissionless and transparent network may be an avenue for a wide range of fraudulent behavior. How can KYC be leveraged to specifically tackle this challenge? All right, so this is an interesting one. <laughs> um, because I think my, my answer, and you know, I, I don't know if uh, my co-panelists, uh, at least some of them may, may agree with this. Uh, my response sort of goes against the principles uh, and sort of the tenets of you know, blockchain and uh, you know, and, and Web3, which is supposed to be, you know, quote unquote, open, you know, I think what you said, open permissionless and, uh, you know, transparent uh, network. Um, I think for, for, for um, you know, mass adoption, um, we have to go the way of user verification. User, you know, because at the end of the day, human psychology dictates, you know, I need to know who I'm transacting, you know, I trust, you more if I know who you are, right? Um, you know, so we, it's it, as much as we want to create this, um, you know, sort of open network where everybody, you know, nobody's doing, um, you know, nobody really knows it because that was really what's, you know, blockchain and, you know, sort of Bitcoin and, you know, uh, was based around. Um, in order to get mass adoption and in order to get, um, you know, and it, for, for you to even get to mass adoption, um, you need people to trust your trust the platform, trust the protocol, and like I said, for people, for a lot of people to trust, uh, in order for them to trust the transaction, trust the platform, trust the recipient, or the counterparts uh, that they're, you know, I may not know this person, but I need somebody that I can hold accountable if something goes wrong. Right, so you for for mass adoption, um, you definitely are, you know a mass adoption and you know less fraudulent um, transactions and fraudulent you know uh, 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 instances. We have to, I think, there has to be a, a, an increased focus on you know some type of KYC. You know, mm -hmm. right? Like that, we're still doing a lot of the traditional KYCs, um, and hopefully, you know, our hope is at some point we get, you know, um, you know, some innovation in that space. Uh, that's, you know, maybe something more Web three based, something that's a combination of traditional, you know, uh, and you know, 
uh, blockchain-based verification. But at the end of the day, it's it's not going to be you know for 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 full uh, adoption and you know critical critical adoption. It's not going to be you know open you know you know open network um, you know trustless or permissionless. It's going to be a mix of somewhere in the middle where you know we have to at least we like I said may not know exactly who I'm you know I'm, 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 I'm you know working with but at least I know somebody has done some type of you know uh, verification um, on who I'm working with and I know that if this person um, you know does something wrong or something goes wrong with this transaction I know who to reach out to mm. um, you know to you know for some type of rect you know uh, rectification or you know uh, resolution to get you know to to correct the wrong that has happened. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jude. Um, over to you, Erican. Web three is a complex space to navigate at present. What are the best ways investors and regulator for investors and regulators to further educate themselves about the ecosystem? So first and foremost, I think what's important is people actually try the technology. So it's one thing to have seen all of the momentum and then unfortunately the setbacks with crypto adoption and blockchain and everything uh, recently, but it's another thing to actually have put your own time and energy and try to, you know, put your own pieces, puzzle pieces together to understand what's happening. So I think a lot of people are speaking about things from afar um, from versus from having actually tried to use DeFi versus from having actually tried to interact with gas fees like there's a lot of things about the industry as it stands today that I think actually we should question like why why are we paying gas fees why are we actually super obsessed with multiple chains there was a time where we used to just get on Facebook or get on the internet and not know what something was built on and I think it's going to be my mic seems to be low Let's see, I can't, you can't hear me properly. Okay, can I you can hear me a little bit I better hear now? I can hear you. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, so essentially what I'm saying is people are going to have to experiment with, with what this is from investors to regulators. And I can tell you right now, there's a lot of investors globally who invest their money in these things, but they don't actually use the stuff. And that was a big eye-opening moment for me, just to know that our peers as venture capitalists are here for this uh, opportunity, but also here for it, for it for different reasons than retail. So an average person is thinking that, you know, I only have small COBOL and I need to like maybe try and put it in stablecoin because I heard about it or Doge or something, but like, and, and that's for a real world uh, demand in their lives, but then you have people putting money into some of the big stable coins or putting money into some of the exchanges internationally that are going to expand into Africa when we have Patricia and we have Bundle and we have Quidax and we have all of these existing entities already because they're just seeing it as another place to put money. And so I think transparently, if, if I may, I do think it is a important to acknowledge that there are a lot of influential players who have different incentives for being in this ecosystem. Um, one other thing I'll say, which I haven't heard so much today, is uh, regulators and investors and everyday people, us learning and recognizing that if we think about past iterations of the internet, let's say, of course, we're still in the 1990s, as certain people in the West like to say, but ultimately, I think within a, in an African context, my hypothesis is that most of this technology is going to become back end technology at some point and very few people are going to be talking about solana or polygon or tron or ethereum or bnb or bsc and i think we're going to get to a point where this is just the computer on the back end of how we use Sorry, Eric, I don't mean to interrupt uh, do you mind speaking uh, just a little bit louder um we've been told by the producer they can't hear you Okay, I don't know what I can do, but I'll do my best. Um, the last comment I just was saying was that we can prepare for this technology being back end technology towards just generally what everyone uses going forward. So there 
if we make it out, <laughs> there could be a world where all of this blockchain stuff and all of these infrastructure things are back end things, even in finance, because we haven't even talked about how blockchain affects supply chain or blockchain affects agriculture or blockchain affects other things outside of finance. Um, and those things are all going to be back end things, things that the average person is probably not thinking about because it's just the technology that makes this industry run. So mm -hmm. I think that that is going to be something that regulators and investors and us here on this call should think about. What does it mean when the technology is running our world and we're not KYCing because we're not, not actually aware that it's actually technology that's being used because it's mm -hmm. just in the background. So yeah. that's like another question, but opportunity to consider. Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to all the all the panelists as well. Um, we had so many more questions to get through, but um, we're not now going to move over to the audience Q&A session, uh, which is also just as exciting. So before we move into that, I want to mention that this event is brought to you by Core ID, a Verify Me company in partnership with Tech Cabal. So during the registration process, you would have been asked, so I'm talking to the audience members now, you would have been asked to submit some questions, but also here and now you can put some questions into the Q&A box and we will be selecting some to answer. All right, we can start with some that were submitted earlier on during the Q&A sets, during the registration process. First one for all of the analysts is, how can we adopt KYC into business solutions? How can, yes, yeah, so that's how can we adopt KYC into business solutions? Oh, let me, let me, uh, uh, is it okay if I, I, I answer first? Um, I think one of the things, uh, uh, the biggest things uh, that we need to be um, somewhat wary of is, um, um, first of all, for Web3, you know, is, Web3 doesn't solve all. Web3 is a new technology. It's a new protocol. It's a new um, exciting you know, uh, innovation uh, that's going to be here for a while. Um, not every company, <laughs> it, it needs Web3. You know, they're, they're, you know, there are very you know, uh, few you know, companies right now who must have Web3. Right, Web three, as I mentioned earlier, it's an accelerant. It's you know, it, it gets you faster to a global you know uh, a stage, um, but not everybody needs it. Um, you, you know, it it shouldn't be a solution of you know a, a situation of hey, you know, this is uh, this is you know, cool. I used to have a boss a long time ago who would read. Uh, yeah, I used to get frustrated. He would read some new article on the train about some new technology uh, startup, uh, or some new technology, you know, thing, you know, on TechCrunch or whatever. And he would come down like, "Oh, Jenny, we need to implement this. We need to implement this." And I'm like, "No, we don't need this. This is, you know, this is this this we don't need this now. You know, it doesn't do anything for us. It's going to take us time to build, um, and it gives us no lifts or it gives very little lifts. We're going to spend, you know, three months building it, and we're going to have two extra users, you know, once in. So I think, long story short, we have to get to a situation that you it has to be a basic understanding first of all of do I need Web three to run my business, or do I does Web three give me any tangible advantage, um, you know, and then you know decide on the next steps, and then that's when you start to decide, you know, integrating with your business, and then you know the KYC requirements and all the other stuff. Um, you know, on top of that. Would anyone care to chime in? Yeah, um, maybe I'll just also add something. Uh, so I think if you remember the question, right, it was KYC and business, right? Yes. yes. So I'll uh, answer, KYC. yeah, I think, you know, GD just answered the parts, you know, relating, you know, to Web3, to businesses, then to KYC. Um, then for for our Zoom business in this case is DeFi, right? So how would KYC, for instance, work in a decentralized world where now there are no, there are no, um, it's not a centralized platform. Let's say PancakeSwap, for those of you that are into crypto in the house, you know, any of these DeFi, you know, apps. So how would KYC work there? Um, I think Vitalik, you know, a couple of, um, months ago, 
um released a concept right it talked about soul bound tokens right um i think um we, we did a pilot for one at binance uh two months ago now soul bound tokens are basically um imagine on a centralized platform you have kyc there right we already have connections to the blockchain we already you know um in in that you know space so a soul bound token for instance can be issued by a platform and basically that would serve as that user's credential on the on the blockchain so for instance user is already kyc on on the platform and issues a soul bound token that is reversible is revocable it's not transferable so it's just a token that indicates that this person is kyc on bundle or binance right and then you know that token can now be built into any DeFi protocol um, so as a DeFi protocol, you can now have you can now have the ability to, you know, create an extra layer for, you know, insert your, you know, um, soul bound token here, and that gives you access to that platform. So in that way, we are tokenizing identity, and you know, allowing those platforms to operate in a more, um, in a safer environment where people know each other at least you know where this person is coming from that kind of thing so it's possible even in DeFi today um but it's still it's still experimental and i think overall we are going to get to that point where you know innovation will continue to to push you know um the what what we see as reality forward to the point where we don't even have to talk about blockchain you know anymore we just know that you're using you know any app and you know at the back end you know all the magic that goes on like this the same way we use zoom and and you know your browser you don't know i heard that for if you click on one link at least 100 actions happen in the background you know you know from this transfer protocol to this one you know so tcp ip and all those kind of stuff we don't talk about it right even developers don't need to know how the internet works they just build code they just write code right so we will come to a point where I can just send Naira to Ghana and at the back end, maybe it's crypto and I don't even need to know about it. So mm -hmm. I think it's going to happen, um, but it's just going to take some time and some experimenting to, to get there. But yes, it's possible to have KYC in DeFi. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Hanu, Erican, would you like to, would you like to contribute to that? Well, on my end, I have no other additions. I think that they've um, done a great job on that already. All right. So a question just came in from the audience, and it says, it says, should the Web3 industry be regulated? It seems conflicting for a decentralized technology as such. Hanu, I'm picking you for that. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question. And I was thinking that during the earlier conversation. Um, so it is not black and white, right? We have to find the off-white um, the off-white point, right? So I think that regulation is necessary for growth, right? Um, but the nature of decentralized exchanges and decentralized protocols goes against everything that regulation stands for. You know, it is very difficult to regulate what was built to not be regulated, you know? Um, so I'm of belief that centralized exchanges should be regulated, right? Um, decentralized exchanges, right? Um, I still think it's very early on um, in terms of how they should be regulated or should they even be regulated, you know, because um, regulation is not in sight because of the nature of how they exist and the purpose with which they were built for, you know. So if you are, my advice here would be, if you are new with crypto, right, you can kick off with it, centralized exchanges like Patricia, like Bondu, get to understand what it is before you on-ramp into the into the decentralized exchanges, 
um, because there's higher risk there. There is the chance of losing everything you own, right? Because you are basically your own custodian. There is no forgot password. That's very important. There is no forgot password. So you lose your keys like myself, who lost my keys many years ago, right? It is going to be a very interesting day for you. So take <laughs> baby steps and, you know, you can work your way through it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just to add to what Hannah has also shared, um, the, the thing about regulation, this is another perspective anyways, is I think the there are, there are different kinds of regulation. There's regulation that is basically about centralizing power and centralizing control, which is, you know, how, you know, largely regulation has always been, right? Um, but there is a key part of regulation, which is about protecting customers, protecting, you know, citizens um, from, from bad actors. And I think that is one area where, you know, um, we would have to really, you know, encourage um, to happen because with DeFi, we have something called, so beyond the risk of you losing your keys, there's also another risk, for instance, of, you know, a rug pool, they call it rug pool, where you see a website one day, you know, you put your funds and next day, you know, the website is showing, you know, server, server not connected. <laughs> you know, so how, how, what stamp of approval do you have to see to know that, okay, this platform, you know, the founder is, someone that someone knows somewhere right um because this because a DeFi platform you don't, don't doesn't have to have a ceo it doesn't have to have a board it's just self-executing code and you know sending revenue to a particular wallet and that's all right um so it's very very um important that we have some form of um regulation for DeFi itself to really go mainstream because in the end DeFi is already gaining a lot of traction, mm -hmm. you unprecedented traction. And that is because of the social impact that it has. Because there are a lot of people that are underserved, a lot of people don't have KYC, right? But they still need loans. There are platforms that give, you know, those kind of services that are very great, right? But in the end, for mainstream adoption to really happen, you need the government to say it's okay because there are some people that will literally not move a pain till the government says, okay, this one is fine, right? Or something like that. So it's so that's that's and for that to happen, some some security measures have to be put in because you can't really stop DeFi, right? You can't really just say we can stop the internet. It will happen. And I think that the future will be decentralized, right? Um, but you need to in that future, then it still needs to be you know, stuff in place that would safeguard the user, right? And that is, I think, the important aspect of regulation that we need to consider. But the centralized and power, you know, you know, control kind of regulation will probably not exist in a decentralized world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, okay, there's an interesting question here. Um, I'm not going to pick someone out to answer it, uh, but if anyone wants to jump in, please do. What is the role and place of a specialist lawyer in all these um, in all these things? <laughs> I, I don't You'd think like I, to... I, I don't think I well, I'm a, uh, yeah. knowledgeable uh, enough to answer that. <laughs> let me, let me, we need a, a compliance, a compliance, uh, a compliance uh, session yeah. for that. But yeah. So, yeah, so let me try, right? Um so blockchain and you know if you look at fintech law and a lot of like the new trends that are happening for fact today we have people that are called blockchain lawyers right um who have spent you know at least maybe three to four years you know trying to navigate around you know how compliance would work in this new you know um industry the 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 place of i think it's more of a compliance kind of you know law rather than like primarily legal right because um from a legal perspective you know most likely everything stays the same you need investors you need this you need that so those those are still like you know traditional but in terms of engaging with regulators compliance you know because right now the industry is largely self-regulated 
you know, we have KYC, we have AML practices, we have CFT. So we have all the things in place that we need to have to run a financial institution, right? Without any requirement from law directly, because we are largely, as they say, unregulated. So that's why we focus on self-regulation. And for us to come up with those kind of things, we, we used, for instance, advice from lawyers and compliance officers locally in each mm -hmm. jurisdiction to say, okay, what are the local laws here? You know, for someone that, you know, is on KYC level one or KYC level two or KYC level three, what kind of transaction limits, for instance, should they have, right? Um, how do we ensure that even though we are not regulated, we can still operate in a way that we don't get into trouble, even regu regulation comes and says, okay, what's happening here? We already just say, okay, yes, we're already doing, we're already operating in higher standards than you even hold the counterparts in like the regulated sector, right? So um, this is, this is, I think, the direction. It's more of a compliance direction um, in terms of the, that, but it's still the same skill sets, right? Um, yeah. That's really the focus. Yeah, thanks, Babs. Very brave of you. And uh, <laughs> I also want to mention to the audience that there will be a poll coming up. Uh, please answer the questions here. Um, some very interesting questions that are going to come up uh, in a poll survey. Also, um, don't forget to fill out the Q&A box with any questions that you have. All right, let's carry on with questions from the audience. Another one that came in during registration. Um, how can we leverage existing mobile money infrastructure to push Web3 adoption? Um, Erica, and I see you nodding. That's a great question, whoever asked that one. Um, and I also have some thoughts on the legal part too, so I can tack that on at the end. But um, to put, give to give some context, so 15 years ago, 2007, two really important technology innovations happened in the world. One, the smartphone was introduced by Apple, which completely changed the game for all of Africa over the last 15 years, given that it is our de device for accessing the internet and so much more. But also in 2007, M-Pesa was released. And that was the mobile money that happened uh, via airtime through at, in Kenya. And it was M-Pesa that actually inspired so many more mobile money uh, technologies globally, all the way over in China and in India and in the US. M-Pesa Kenyans created such a meaningful traction across mobile money activity that the entire world changed how they thought about money on these new smartphones that were introduced. So I wanna just put that into context so we know what as Africans our impact on global technology is. And that mobile money market is now, guess what, everybody? A $1 trillion market. So 15 years ago, Kenyans decided that we wanted to send money to each other on our mobile phones. And now there's $1 trillion moving around from phone to phone to phone, um, unbanked, un, uh, you know, debatably how regulated it is. But on top of that, 70% of that $1 trillion is just Africa. So $700 billion on our mobile phones in Africa only is what we do. And to me, in my opinion, uh, I am fully, fully invested in what mobile has to offer relative to blockchain because that is where most Africans are. And it is so interesting that so many technologies today, particularly those that are made in the US or like predominantly by Americans, how they're focused on laptops. They're focused on assuming you have con consistent Wi-Fi. They're focused on you not being in the middle of a transaction and NEPA taking light. They're focused on all of these different things that are very much different from our reality. You know what I mean? And so I think mobile phone integrations is going to be most important, but also a bit, uh, if we're not prepared, can be another scary wave if we don't actually create more protections now before every mm -hmm. single person in the village now finds themselves on some sort of speculative DeFi thing and finding themselves really hurt and no one else to really find them because they're in some remote place. So mobile phones are going to be the next wave 
Mm -hmm. for blockchain technology for sure but we actually i would hope that we can get regulation sooner than that and i actually think we need a lot of different types of lawyers going back to that really fast um uh, lots of different types of lawyers who speak all the different types of lawyers speak in all the different countries in all the different regulatory zones so i think this is the renaissance for lawyers transparently and um i would love to see more people stand out and try and offer up language and structures and frameworks and protocols proactively for regulatory bodies and for anybody who is preparing to take legal action against another entity the legal profession is super important today speaking of regulations will the tax operations bill proposed in nigeria and kenya be be accommodated by the web3 industry that's a question for anyone who wants to um, jump in. So, yeah, I think you know, as part of regulation, regulation it's not it's not just about KYC, even though you know KYC is why we're we're, on, we're all on here today. Um, regulation is a lot of things, most of which is you know tax um, for 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 uh, government entities and um, you know you know legislation, you know people who are uh, managing legislation. For them to sort of allow easy pass through of these technologies and these protocols, and you know they they have to see the benefits, not just to um, you know the companies that are trying to implement it, not just to the population that you know that's the, you know that these are you know technologies are being introduced to, but also to the you know the, the country and the principalities that they, they exist in. Well, how does it benefit us? Um, it, it it it's it's not a popular uh discussion especially you know um you know when you're you're, you're direct, this is directed at um at you know the, the, the companies that are trying to implement this but it has to be because um for, for it to exist and for it to operate legally in any country in most countries they have to see from the, the tax benefits um and how this would benefit the, the, the country as a whole. Um, so the, it, it's it's not a popular one. It's not a popular, um, you know, discussion. But from a regulatory perspective, it's it's something that um, has to be taken into account because, um, you know, like I said, and I, I mentioned this earlier, it you know, it's not just because it's new technology doesn't exempt it from being traditional uh, 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 transactions, you know, it's payment. Every time you make a, 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 a pay for something um, at a store, uh, VAT is charged. Um, every time you do a transfer, uh, somebody, you're paying the rails, uh, you know, for, you know, uh, rail fees, for you know, somewhere. Um, every time you do, you know, trading days, you know, the, the, the trading companies, um, you know, uh, it, pay some type of you know taxes um for what they're doing you know so just because you're a new technology you can't say oh you know oh and we're permissionless and we're blockchain based when we you know we're, we're we're exempt from it it has to be you know it, it, it can be a situation where you know um you think you know we're not supposed to do this just because we're blockchain based if you want to operate legally within the country you still have to have you know blockchain is more about and web3 is more about the technology as opposed to um you know what you're doing so yes you're te technology but you're still doing things within and operating within a you know country you have to think about you know sort of tax implications um of what you're doing absolutely Thanks, Jude. Thanks. Uh, so there have been more questions come in. Let's see. Um, I saw some interesting ones earlier on. Yes. Yeah, so beyond the social impact of regulation, it, uh, beyond the social impact, regulation is there to protect the customers too. So what conversations are being had with regulators? Uh, do you, does anyone mind if I take this one first? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, cool. Uh, well, you know, we're we're very very. Um, uh, it's something that we have a a huge team. Well, I, well, I won't call it a huge team, but a significant team, um, doing a lot of uh, discussions with you know, especially in Nigeria where we where we exist, uh, at least where we're you know we're headquartered. Um, 
we're working on, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of uh, uh, solutions that we we currently offer to, you know, to, um, you know, uh, Web3 and crypto based uh, companies in Nigeria and Ghana, um, but it's still based off of quote unquote traditional you know, verifications, BVN, NIN. Uh, and for some for some uh, Web3 companies, we're actually doing physical address verification where we have our agents go to someone's house um, and verify their addresses. You know, we're sort of move, hopefully moving towards uh, more mobile-based uh, address verification. But what we're, long story short, um, you know, we're, we're working, you know, uh, uh, some, some solutions, one of which is an Oracle-based, um, you know, uh, Web three verification that allows allows um, you know companies like hopefully you know Patricia and Binance instead of doing the NIN and BVN offline, you know, before letting them onto their platform, we do that on chain. The problem with that, uh, or the slight problem, you know, depending on who's you know who's uh, uh, looking or who you're asking, is what are the the regulatory and legal and compliance uh, issues with taking a BVN that literally, or NIN that literally sits in a government database somewhere and putting that on chain. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, we want to be, we want to be a technology, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, f forward uh, and build fantastic things um, and run, you know, run really quick. But we have to understand that we, you know, we have to work, you know, we can't within the regulatory space and compliance and figure out what's uh, legally and from a government perspective, would they allow us to do, you know, because, so we don't get into trouble. And we have mm -hmm. these conversations with them. We have, a, you know, uh, you know, uh, a, a conversations around, you know, um, you know, solutions that we're building around wallet monitoring, um, you know, um, transaction monitoring, because there are transactions, you know, even though they are, you know, especially in Nigeria, there's there's been a um, ban on banks, you know, sort of some banks accepting payments from, from, from crypto com uh, companies, there is, there's two transactions going on and you know we from a government perspective they would like to you know monitor and at least know what's going on with this transaction so as not you know we can uh for aml purposes for anti-terrorism purposes so we are building from a core id perspective we are building solutions that allow you know faster and you know um you know much more uh future focused uh, compliance and kyc um, solutions uh, and it's something that we have you know we have a, a dedicated uh you know a, a, a sort of a lawyer and compliance person literally, literally that's you know all he does is go government relations and um mm -hmm. you know uh, uh web3 and blockchain and kyc is now a big part of what he's been you know the discussions that he's been having mm. okay and um i guess as a connector to that um, another question from the audience is, how can we improve KYC for central bank digital currencies amidst a defunct identity management system? Hanu, would you like to chip in? Okay, um, I would like to also um, comment on the previous question before I, I take this next question. Um, so in terms of um, engagement with regulators, I think that is something that um, everybody needs to get involved with. Um, I, I see it like the elections, right? We have to get involved with who we elect as our leaders, and we equally have to get involved with um, the regulations for our businesses and for our country. You know, and um, something that really gave me a lot of hope was the startup bill that has now become the Startup Act um, that basically prevents uh, the issues we have seen in the past with ride hailing companies being banned and um, crypto exchanges also being banned from um, transacting with the fintechs and the banking institutions in Nigeria. And the uh, Startup um, Bill um, or the Startup Act now, as it's called, basically, um, basically protects um, Nigerian businesses from such reality moving forward as proper dialogue would need to have happened before such um, decisions would be taken. You know, so um, regulation is every business owner business owner's business. So we need to get involved now more than ever. Um, that's on that part. Now on the second part with the CBDCs and KYC, that's a very tricky question, you know, um, because 
The CBDC, especially the e naira in Nigeria, has not had so much success. Um, and it has still been limited to very few institutions, you know, um, and uh, these institutions, for example, the regular banks, traditional banks, they have their own KYC module already. So it already follows the existing KYC, um, KYC module. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not sure that they are trying to um, make it um, open source where other parties can connect to it. And that is when we now begin to have the conversation of what type of KYC um, um, requirements do we need for the CBDCs? You know, so right now they follow the banking partners um, um, existing KYC framework, and that's what it is. But on a larger conversation on the in era, I think that the government had a very bright idea that wasn't executed properly. And I'm still, still, still of the idea of not bringing enough people to the table, you know, to be able to help these, um, to help these initiatives succeed, you know, because um, I'm of the opinion that um, the government's job is to create policies, right, to support the businesses. You know, case in point, America, right, um, they are one of the biggest economies in the world. Right, and um, they have very interesting policy, and um, they're always at loggerheads, right? Because policy is 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 important for growth, right? As Babs talked about, defying policy in um, in um, policy making and whatnot, right? So um, I still believe that the era can be a success, but it needs to be put in the right rooms. It needs to be put into the exchanges that people go to um, access, access Web3 facilities, people go to access crypto facilities, and that's where we need to pay our attention to. And um, yeah, these are my thoughts. Yeah. Thanks so much, Hanu. And uh, thanks to everyone um, in the panel. The, uh, the poll, poll results are now in, and I'm going to share those with the audience. But, you know, sadly, this is all we have time for today. I'd like to ask the panelists if they have any final parting thoughts. Um, I'll go first if no one's uh, <laughs> no one uh, uh, has any objections. Uh, uh, you know, I, I come here um, um, a little a little you know biased <laughs> in, a, in, a, in our message uh, from a co ID perspective. Um, uh, you know, but I, you know, even with my bias, um, I honestly, and, you know, I think it's a, you know, I, I hope it's a subjective view from, you know, a majority, uh, sorry, objective view from a, from a majority of, uh, you know, the, the panel and, you know, our attendees um, for mass and critical adoption, um, you know, of uh, Web3 uh, and blockchain technologies, there has to be some type of, um, you know, KYC, some type of identity verification. You know, I really just, I'm trying to understand, you know, I may not know, like I mentioned earlier, I may not know everybody I'm transacting with. If I'm doing a transfer, uh, transfer, I'm doing a transaction with you. I don't need to know your name. I don't need to know your phone number. I don't need to know your, your address, but uh, I want to have you know, some trust in the, um, you know, in, within the space I'm working with, the entity I'm working with, to say, um, you know, this person that I'm trying, trying, you know, uh, I'm doing a transaction with, has uh, passed some level of, you know, identity verification or some some level of KYC. You know, just like the same way I would use PayPal when I'm sending money, uh, paying money to somebody. I just don't, you know, I, I don't need to know who you are. It's usually a screen name, and mm -hmm. I know that hey, this person is, you know, but I know that PayPal has done some type of, you know, verification on this person. Mm -hmm. I think as much as we want to say, hey, blockchain, permissionless, you know, open network or whatever, um, you know, there has, you know, we, there there has to be some level of, of KYC, um, you know, and verification for it to get to that point where anybody can go on there and say, you know what, I don't have to worry about, you know, losing my shirt, losing all my money, um, you know, or, you know, like bad mentioned, some type of, you know, rock pool, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, and at least have confidence and sleep better knowing that uh, my transaction is, uh, is safe. Thanks, Jude. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, um, Babs, please. 
Okay, let me just, um, I think from my side, um, parting was really just border around um, the huge need for more content and education within within this industry. And, you know, um, as, as I said earlier, regulation is important and there has to definitely be a middle ground between education, um, between regulation and decentralization, right? We have to meet in the middle and ensure that together, because we have similar interests as operators together with the regulators, we, we share common interest of wanting to protect the customer, right? So um, that is a foundation that we can build on to ensure that even going into this new era, we can you know, do so in a safe and secure manner for everyone. Thanks, Babs. Okay. Um, well, I want to say thank you to the organizers once more. Um, it's been interesting sharing the panel with all of you guys, my fellow panelists, and our host that day. Um, and also to Core ID for setting it up. I'm definitely going to look at Core ID after now and see if there's a room for Sydney to Patricia. Um, final words on the topic would be. Um, I 100% agree that KYC, knowing your customer is important for scalability, for growth, for trust. Um, on the Web3 space generally, I'd like to say if you know a crypto bro or a crypto sis, send them your love. We are going through difficult times right now. Send us, <laughs> send us your love. You know, but, <laughs> but ultimately, um, it's still early days. Uh, it's still early days for the crypto space and web three space in Africa and in Nigeria. Um, I have so much faith in it that it's gonna it's going to um, become the new frontier of innovation. Um, gone are the days where the um, fossil fuel companies are gonna rule the world. It's technology, it's gonna be technology and I am having a huge bet on web three being um, the leader of the fifth revolution. And I'm um, excited to see what has come off of the space so far in the last couple of years. And um, I'm very hopeful to see what is going to come out, you know, and um, I'm always happy to be a part of these sessions. And thank you to the organizers once more for, you know, setting this up. It is most appreciated and um, well done. Thanks, Hanu. And last but not least, Erican. Yes, indeed. I also am grateful for this platform and to every single person. We had 100 people here at our highest. And so to everybody who's curious, I think this is amazing. Um, my um, last thought is that we ultimately need more people who are going to build technology that they think is a better version than what exists today. And that can feel like a big feat, but you know, the amazing entrepreneurs here on this call right now, you all took a bold leap at whatever point in time you did to build these businesses. So first of all, we wanna thank you for even getting us here because it's what you all have built that has us even in discussion about what is happening for Africans. So we also just have to say that, you know, give you all your flowers for what you're building, um, but know that we need more people in the audience right now who are going to build a cybersecurity thing or going to build an Oracle thing or going to build the mobile money, you know, uh, the PayPal equivalent or, you know, there's so many things that still need to be built that don't also only involve finance that can be completely away from speculation and can be sheerly, this is just good technology, better technology for an African solution and problem. So I just, my job is to encourage all of the people who have the audacity to start a new business. And um, I want to remind everybody to remain encouraged, but really trust your unique perspective on what you think should exist and consider building a business or at least tinkering with the idea of what's in your mind because it's very possible that your unique perspective on what the gaps are in this industry today and what you think it should look like is the path forward so just really want to encourage people to think outside of the the wave and the momentum everyone else is and be outside of the box because ultimately that's what we need to get out of this this 
hole that we're in right now. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank Core ID for their support in putting this event together. Core ID is, uh, sorry, Tech Cabal Data Research and Intelligence Unit, which provides actionable data on startups and the tech ecosystem across Africa to investors, entrepreneurs, big tech companies, regulators, and other players on and off the continent. So once again, thank you to the audience and please subscribe to the TC Daily Newsletter. Erican, Babs, Anu, Jide, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks guys, appreciate it.